his presentation was made in collaboration with Tim Dillinger and God's Music Is My Life. To help support the completion of this independent project, please consider donating to the links in the description or the pinned comment. Thank you. Two hard-legged men rubbing on one another. It's an abomination to God and to nature. The devil is a liar. But if you look at half of our choirs and a great number of our artists that we call abominations and we call demons, we demonize and dehumanize the same people that we use and we don't say nothing about the gay choir director because he's good for business. As long as the choir sound good, I ain't saying nothing about his sexuality. I love what um, Bishop Yvette Flunder always says. She says there would be no gospel music without gay people because ultimately, like, we created it. It's a art form that is so closely linked with gay culture, but also has schisms in relationship to gay culture. Oh, swing low, carry on. Oh, swing low, carry on. Oh, yeah. Swing low, carry on. Oh, yeah. Swing low, carry on. Oh, so there's a respectability politic. You know, most of the time, if your talent's great enough and you're not flamboyant enough, people will just kind of accept you and let you go by and let you have your career and other people aren't capable of that it's just not either they're just not capable of it or it's not their desire and so from that we get some of the greatest you know entertainers in soul music disco music <laughs> sylvester was a child of the church you know sang in the los angeles community choir before he became sylvester with you know the hop band and part of the coquettes and so there's this whole alternative gospel history that we're finally, people are finally starting to acknowledge and talk about. I feel like it comes out at its best when we talk about disco. I feel like disco and dance music is really where we get the full throttle story of gays and gospel, gays who came out of gospel, um, and disco music as gospel, because so much of the output of the 70s just is gospel music. Even if gospel radio stations and gospel promoters didn't put these artists on their programs, they were, it was gospel music to a disco beat accepted by a secular audience. The gospel airs of Dayton, Ohio, God Helps Those Who Help Themselves, was a minor disco hit. 21st century singers, they did a record called um, Sunday Night Fever, uh, as opposed to, you know, Saturday Night Fever. Um, Gloucester Williams, Calvin Bridges and Spirit of Love. I mean, so there were a lot of gospel people playing with the sound and a certain segment of church people loved that because they could have something comparable and could even maybe sneak off to the discos, but they had gospel music that sounded like disco. There's the disco period, but there's this period, particularly in like the 80s, the early 90s. It's like an interesting time in gospel where a lot of them are per se crossing over, but they aren't necessarily crossing over into the R&B or into the pop. When they say they're having these hits or they're crossing over is into the club and the dance sure. worlds. Well, there's two things were happening in the 80s. And so the the first thing to look at, because the first 80s moment you get is, is the Clark sisters, you brought the sunshine. So the, the Clark sisters were a huge breakthrough, not a huge breakthrough in the, the sense of like, what had happened in the 70s. So in the 70s, you had two groups that we actually know of. One was a quartet, the Mighty Clouds of Joy, and they were they scored their first disco hit in the 70s with Mighty High. And, 
And so that was getting like disco play before there was a disco chart. At the same time, you also get the New York Community Choir. They did a song called I'll Keep a Light in My Window, which had been recorded by um, the Mighty Clouds of Joy, actually, like the same year. Um, and a few other like inspirational uh, artists. The difference with New York Community Choir and Mighty Clouds was they actually went into the discos. They didn't just say, thank you for playing us. We can't come to the discos because we're good, holy people. And so the Mighty Clouds and New York Community Choir both did that, much to the outrage of church people. The Clark sisters chose to not do that. And they actually did that rather publicly, which was very smart in, in the sense of they totally milked that controversy to help that song have more life. New York Community Choir um, did not acknowledge that there was any hubbub even going on. They were just kind of above the fray. Uh, we just are who we are and we do what we do, which doesn't help sell records. <laughs> <laughs> Mighty Clouds, you know, they got a jet story out of it. You know, they had a big fight with James Cleveland and, or James Cleveland had a big fight with them, I should say, about their direction. But after the Clark sisters, you get Tremaine Hawkins, which to me is like the real story and the real continuation of what the Mighty Clouds and New York Community Choir began. And so Tremaine leaves Light Records, where she'd been since the beginning of her solo career. And she really desired to do something um, bigger, not out of step with at the same time what Amy Grant on the contemporary Christian side was trying to do with crossing over. Amy wanted to reach a broader audience, sing um, not so directly Christian songs. The difference though, is that Tremaine really did not alter her message. First it was the 12 inch single, which was Fall Down. But Fall Down hit number one on the dance chart, which had never, in 1985, which had never, ever happened before for a gospel group. And hits number one and the church people, you know, lose their poop. That there were backward messages embedded in the song about having sex and, I mean, just really just outrageous things. But Tremaine is like riding this wave because she signed directly to AM, which is the same label that has a distribution agreement with Amy Grant. So Fall Down doesn't stop there because Tremaine actually went into the clubs and started performing as well. People, you know, I think they forgot that the Mighty Clouds had done this. I think they forgot that the New York Community Choir had done this because it was all brand new again. And she was so castigated for that. I mean, Fall Down, that whole record, Search is Over, had three charting dance singles. Three. It wasn't just Fall Down. There was Child of the King in the morning time. And you listened to those songs and you were getting an explicitly gospel album. People were doing really bold things. So yes, Vanessa, um, Genobia Jeter, who, you know, really should get a lot more, Glenn Jones' wife, should get a lot more um, attention for for attempting to do gospel and R&B in one. What I notice is the third through line in all of this is that these women are all charting with in the club or the, the music that's associated heavily with gay yes. culture. So do you think the backlash from the church was because they knew that's who was buying yeah. up the music? Absolutely. If, if, in fact, I, I'll refer people to my God's Music Is My Life .substack .com, my feature on Tremaine. I actually, that's my argument, is that the outrage was about 
who she was singing to, because you also cannot talk about these albums and these songs and these women going and singing for the children without talking about it as the AIDS era, the era of the AIDS epidemic, which was quietly, you know, re destroying music departments in churches. And so it was also like raising to the forefront the church's hypocrisy around homosexuality for a Tremaine to go into the garage and Studio 54 um, in the incarnation it was at that time was a huge statement that she was not making these lines of delineation that she really did believe the gospel was for everyone. Mm -hmm. And she talked about the church's attitude towards homosexuality. And she said something to the effect of they would rather um, shun it than accept it. Speaking of all this gospel and the overlap of gay culture, I heard you referenced him more than a few times as one of the originators, one of the leaders of this movement, and that is the New York City Community Choir. Right. And you're working on expounding upon this story and this project of this intersection between all of these themes. Could you just talk to us a little bit about that? I mean, I, I started working on this in 2014 as my thesis. I went back to school late in life, college, and uh, knew I wanted to go to graduate school. And so right away, my advisor said, well, you're going to need to write a thesis. I said, well, I don't even have to think about it. I want to write about the New York Community Choir. I wanted their story because there was something in the sound of the New York Community Choir that was different. You could say that might have been a little bit of my gaydar going off to a certain extent, but I knew they were free. I knew they were free. I found the choir's um, co-founder, Benny Diggs. He was their director as well. And I said, this is what I hear when I hear y'all. Why do I hear that? And he said, because that's who we were. Benny Diggs, Arthur Freeman, uh, Wilbur Johnson, Isaac Douglas, who were the original co-founders. They were very much interested in taking gospel outside of the church. So from the very beginning, that's what they were doing. They did it first with the Black Arts Movement. Um, Benny formed a subgroup called Revelation. They started performing in clubs as early as 1973 and started then getting into the New York session world. So they were doing sessions for like Carly Simon and um, uh, uh, Vicki Sue Robinson. Uh, they were on the original um, album that had turned the beat around. They were doing background vocals on that record. So they were getting their feet wet with disco. Uh, in 1977, the album that had the hit, Express Yourself, and um, it changed the game. And so you hear the next year they did a second record, Make Every Day Count, 1978. And they had a whole run in the discos. And you will start to hear their influence. Shirley Caesar acknowledges when she does her First Lady record, which has like two disco cuts on it, that she's looking at the New York Community Choir. You know, she says that in uh, uh, Record World. Um, she's looking at this new direction that people are going in and she wants to replicate it. Arthur Freeman, uh, who co-wrote Express Yourself and again was the choir's co-founder with Benny, talks about the experience of going into the discos and meeting the children, meeting the, the people who were disenfranchised from the church. They came from a very, the choir came from a very open and affirming church. And in New York, they were very much branded as you know, you'll hear in the in the short, Arthur Freeman says they were branded as um, everybody was gay. Everybody was gay, they came from a gay church. And that really wasn't the case. They were not an exclusively gay choir. Their church was not an exclusively gay church. It was a church that welcomed and affirmed gay people, um, which in the, you know, the seventies was still taboo. And so this is why I think they're so important. Arthur Freeman, before he passed, he, he said to me, like, make sure our story gets told. And uh, I'm staying on that. I'm staying on that because this is vital. It's vital history. You know, when I hear 
kids today, we should not still be struggling with people coming out in the church. We should not still be struggling with churches, putting people out. You know, we need to do better in terms of educating people and letting people know they have always existed in these environments. And that's the real reason for this story. And that's a great note to end on. So thank you so much, Tim. And to the viewers, Tim's information is in the description box as well as the pinned comment. If you love my work, you will definitely love Tim's because I've learned a lot from Tim. And I did before I even knew I was learning from before we even met. So wow. thank you so much, Tim. Thank you. So yes, thank you. And uh, I'll see you soon. We'll talk That's soon. Right. That's right. I'll be back in New York soon. <laughs> All right.